As members of the Christian Church, we confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and proclaim Him Lord and Savior of the world. In Christ's name and by His grace, we accept our mission of witness and service to all people. We rejoice in God, maker of heaven and earth, and in God's covenant of love which binds us to God and to one another. Through baptism into Christ, we enter the newness of life and are made one with the whole people of God. In the communion of the Holy Spirit, we are joined together in discipleship and in obedience to Christ. At the table of the Lord, we celebrate the thanksgiving, the saving acts, and presence of Christ. Within the universal church, we receive the gift of ministry and the light of Scripture. In the bonds of Christian faith, we yield ourselves to God that we may serve the one whose kingdom has no end. Blessing, glory, and honor be to God forever. Our scripture today is in a couple of sections, and I, I entitled it Empowered by Jesus. <clears throat> Being empowered by anything is what we try to, uh, to seek, you know, be it an education, um, a relationship with someone. Uh, something to give you power, something to give you something. The first one we're going to talk about today is Matthew 9, 35 through 8. Now, as usual, I kind of like to give a little context rather than just jumping into where it's on 35. <coughs> What's going on right now is uh, Jesus was doing some healing. He healed a blind man and uh, told them, you know, don't tell anyone about this. See that no one knows about this. But they went out joyful and spread the news anyway. And then while they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed could not talk, brought to Jesus. Now, demon-possessed is a, could be an illness, could be a malady of some kind mentally, or he just could be a bad person. Well, we know things in all that category. Couldn't talk, was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man was able to speak and everybody was amazed. But of course, the Pharisees said, oh, it is only by the prince of demons that he's able to do that. So there they are again. Doubt me. Okay. Matthew 9, 35 through 10, 8. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter, his brother Andrew, 
James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, <clears throat> Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. And raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Because freely you have received and freely give. So Jesus is going through all these towns actually preaching. Actually preaching. Actually preaching. Healing sickness and disease. Teaching them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And spreading the good news of the kingdom. Now we're kind of used to here spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's Jesus spreading the same good news, but of God the Father and the healing and the help that He can give and the compassion He has on all these people. They were harassed and helpless. He's looking out the window today at people. We've got the same people Today, look, you can look out and see. We have to have compassion on them. Sheep without a shepherd. How perfect is that metaphor? Sheep wandering around without a shepherd. Get lost, get too far away, get killed and eaten. Jesus realizes that we got to get these sheep we got to get our flock together first before anything can happen. Now why in this junk, at this part of the Scripture, why is it once again listing all the apostles and who they were, who their father was, whatever, if they were brothers or not, why now? We kind of already knew that, right? I mean, when you read it, it's like, okay, I already know this, but okay. Something I like to just keep driving home. Those guys are us. We can see those people in us. We can see every one of those people outside of here, in town, at work, our friends, neighbors, family. All these people are there. So we, sometimes we've got to be reminded that these are not lost, lofty, wonderful guys he picked up. He picked up some regular and some pretty low people. He said, follow me, and they did. Maybe that's all they had. Maybe I got nowhere else to go. I might as well follow him. Maybe God put them in that position. Maybe God put me in my position of years ago having everything great and then losing everything and then God going, okay now, son, you're ready. You got to kind of look beyond these, these things that, that easily get read over. There's, there's a reason for it being there. Do not go among the Gentiles. What? Well, I thought the whole thing was we got to spread to the Gentiles. That's what all Acts and what Paul, that's what we're doing here. No, not at this point. What if he'd have sent at this point, while Jesus is still walking around preaching, being controversial, 
Pharisees saying, uh, no, he's a prince of demons. People laughing at him still, even though they see it. They see the miracle, just like we see things, but we still scoff. We still doubt. The disciples, right to the very end, still doubted. Had to poke their hand, fingers in his hand. What would have happened if they just went ahead and he said, all right, just go. Go to the... Every one of them would die. They'd have been killed, every one of them. Jesus knows that can't happen yet. So when you see that, don't go to the Gentiles. That seems kind of odd to us because, well, we are Gentiles. And that's always what we've been taught. That's what we mostly hear is reach out, go. He said, no. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. He sees the lost sheep. He doesn't say it in here. But think about this. Jesus never sends them. Well, you know, we did this a couple weeks ago. Sending you out as disciples. Sending you out. We talked about we need to go out. He does not do that until after He was resurrected. Because now He's empowered. He's empowered with the resurrection to then send them out with that. Instead of just be a Jew. No, no, there's more to it than that. But we got to get these guys, we got to get the our house together first. Okay? Empowerment. That resurrection empowered him. I had a kid one time on my team would write an Isaiah scripture on his forearm pad. And I, I looked it up. I, mean, I don't remember. I, I looked it up. And it was about putting on the breastplate, the armor of the Lord, the, the, the helmet of justice and all this, and wielding the sword of, of whatever. And that was on his thing. And I said, oh, why do you do that? Because you hit people with it? He goes, no, it just makes me feel stronger. It empowered him. That putting that on there made him, empowered him. When we have a good relationship, a good marriage, we try to empower each other, don't we? We try to help each other. That's empowering. That's giving you the feeling that, oh, I can do this. And maybe to empower you, God needs to just knock you down and take away everything because we're human. But if he does, you're in the best spot in the world because you know what's down there at the bottom? I've been there. You know what's there? God's hands. Jesus' hands. That's what's down there. That's where you want to be because they're going to lift you right back up. It's like they did me. It's like they did will. He will everybody if you believe. It's like the old things you ever hear though. Guy walking down the street, reading the newspaper, he falls in a hole. And he, walls are too slick to get up. He can't. He's like, priest walks by, not to pick on priest. Priest walks by, or a clergyman walks by and says, "Hey, Father, can you help me out here? I, I need a, I need help." He goes, "Well, he gave him a blessing, gave him a prayer, and went on." A little bit later. Guy walks by and he's, hey, Fred, man. He's his buddy. Hey, man, help me out. I'm down here. Fred, okay. Steps over right into the hall. Right down there with him. And he goes, man, what are you doing? Now we're both stuck down. He goes, no, no, no. I know the way out. I've been down here before. It's my job. It's our job as ministers. That's our job that Jesus sent us to do. Get in the hole. They're in the hole. You've got to get down there with them. Jesus is telling these guys now, you're going to have to get down there with your, your fellow Jews because they're a mess. 
and they're wandering all over the place. And they got these guys up here, the Pharisees, taking all their money, telling them how bad everything is. You know, Jesus never mentions the Romans as the persecutors. You know why? He don't care. They're just Romans. They're just political people. What does he say? Whose picture's on that coin? Well, Caesar. Well, they'd give it to Caesar. It's his. You're God's. You're coming with me. He don't care about that. He cares about his own people. He cares about his own people turning on each other. And until he has the empowerment of resurrection, he can't go after the Gentiles. Nobody's going to listen. But that, that empowerment people has kept us going till this very moment today in every church in the world today. That same empowerment of the resurrection is why we're here. Got a good friend of mine. Totally believes in Bigfoot. People make fun of him. He asked me, what do you think? I said, man, I believe in a resurrected Jesus Christ. How can I doubt anything? You don't believe in the resurrected Jesus Christ, but you believe in Bigfoot. So how, I'm not going to doubt anything because I believe in a resurrected Christ that saves us to this day. That saved me. I'm sure it saved some of y'all. Freely you have received, freely give. I was once the treasurer for a ministerial association where I was at at the time. And we would get money in to help people. It was a separate account. It was for just people that would come to us, whether it was groceries, rent, hospital, whatever. That's what it was for. When I started doing it, well, they had a lot of money. They, they got more money than my church does. You know why? Because they weren't using it. They were getting that money and just, ooh, it's money. Look how, ooh, it's growing. Ooh, well, here, here, here's 25 bucks. Go get some groceries. No, that changed. One day at one of the meetings, they looked at the budget and went, my goodness, where'd $1,500 go? I said, I got it all right here. So and so, I went and got groceries for a week. Took it to them. So and so, I did this. Uh, this girl down here that we all know has got a drug problem, still got to pay her rent. So I paid her rent. And they just couldn't believe it. I said, isn't that what the money's for, guys? It was given to us to give. What given to us to keep? We are given freely, so we should give freely. Jesus gives us everything we need. Jesus is there for us, so we got to be there for everybody else. No, it ain't easy. Yes, it takes a lot of time. I hear some of y'all schedules for the week while we're talking. My goodness. You're supposed to, some, some of you are supposed to be retired, and you don't know what that means, apparently, because you're busy every day. And some of it, and a lot of it's church work, CWF, for everything. You're given freely. That's what you have to do. If you receive freely, give freely. If you're not, start. There's no penalty. Just start doing it. Let's, let's flip over to Romans. <clears throat> 5, 1 through 8. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. 
Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character and hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rare will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly die, dare or die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He empowered us. A couple of things in here that, that it's hard. It can be hard to preach for some. I personally feel take this very personal. Gives me hope. Also rejoice in our sufferings. That's what I'm talking about. Rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, character, and hope. And hope does not disappoint. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to see anybody suffer in any way, shape, or form. But the one who's suffering lets Jesus in. And uses that empowerment to get away or out of the suffering, you are going to be stronger. You're going to be better. I know I talk about football a lot, but I, it's a great example, guys. You want to be good? You want to be great? You want to start? You want to be all state? You want to go play in college? You're going to spend a lot of long, lonely winter days and nights in a weight room or in a gym. And it is suffering. It hurts. It's not fun. You've got friends. You've got girlfriends. You've got homework to do. But if you do it, if you have a coach that shows you the love and the what can happen, just like Jesus is telling us all along here, when you're done with this suffering, wow, you're going to be good. Summer, summer football practice, notoriously. It's, it's, it's meant to be tough because you've got to get... Weed out the people that can't take care of themselves so they don't get hurt, okay? Sounds cruel, but, you know, it's something that you go through. But you go through it with, while you're suffering, you just know that I'm coming out of it. Any Marines in there? Anybody know any Marines? I got several good friends who were Marines. They say at the end of boot camp, you go through this thing called the crucible. And people die. <laughs> and it's several days of being out in the woods on your own with way too much pack, uh, stuff to pack and no sleep and disorientation and cold. And if you make it, if you make it up that last hill that last day, they pin that globe and eagle on you. You did it. Don't always look at suffering as 
That's bad, I guess, to say. Nobody wants to be in pain. Nobody wants to hurt. Nobody wants to see anybody. But we are empowered by Jesus to empower them. To talk to them. My dad couldn't talk anymore a couple of days before he passed. Grabbed that hand, and that old sheet metal worker hand grabbed me and hung on tight. And he calmed down. He quit, he quit being restless. He went to sleep finally. Because of the touch, like we talked about last week. Your song today. I'm, I almost can't talk about it. Daddy's hand. I mean, come on. So good Jesus empowers us. The Bible empowers us. We empower each other. But just like the wellspring of the, life, the water of life, that we talked about before that Jesus wants to spring forth, forth from us and we'll never be thirsty again. You got to use this empowerment to let it shine out. You got to go do things. And like I said, like I've said many times, you need to do this with as few words as possible. Nobody wants to be preached to. But he's going to be loved. And they'll get it. They'll see. Oh, you go to church? Really? Okay. Yeah, it's pretty nice. We, we enjoy it. Have good music. Oh. Preacher's a cool guy. Well, maybe I'll come check it out. That's all you got to do. You'd be surprised how every now and then be one, two. You just got to go out and do it. Be empowered. Let the empowerment of God be in your life. Take the things that come in your life as, as a blessing somehow, some way. It's a blessing. You'll get something out of it. You'll learn something. The suffering's never. So, There's something else I want you to realize. Suffering is never for nothing. There's a reason for it. And you fight that reason. You do away with that reason. Now, I'm not going to lie to you about this either. Sometimes healing is God letting him pass. The body's had it. It can't do it anymore. So God heals them by letting them come on. Letting them pass with peace. That's That's a healing too. That's empowering. Peace and joy through suffering. It's hard to talk about, but boy, it's something that happens to everybody, isn't it? We all go through it. We all go through it probably more than we do joy because that's life. So turn that around and use it to your advantage. Dear Lord, thank you for these words that you've given us to study. Thank you for this Bible that you have inspired to make us think, to make us seek, to empower us. Use us, Lord, as your tools. Bless all the fathers. Give us all a good day. Thank you, Lord. Amen.